Hello, friends, and welcome to Your Daily Detroit. It is Thursday, August 11th, 2022. I'm Jer Stays, and today we're going to be talking about some medical things with our good friend, Dr. Paul Thomas, Plum Health Direct Primary Care. How are you, sir? Jer, it's great to be here. Always phenomenal to be in your presence, and I'm excited to talk about some important topics today. For sure. I've always known you to be a gentleman, a scholar, and to tell us how it is and like what we really need to be thinking about. I've got three topics on my mind that are very newsworthy. First, we'll start with monkeypox, which has been kind of on the minds of a lot of news people. There's been a lot of talk about the communities it's in, all of that. So I think to get things started, let's set the table and say, what exactly is monkeypox? If you've been looking at articles or whatever, and you're not really sure, what exactly is monkeypox, Doc? It's a virus that's been around for a while, since 1958. It was first observed in monkeys that were being researched. And then we first had a human case in 1970. And it's kind of like a virus that's always been present in Central and Western African countries. But now we've had this 2022 outbreak. You know, we've seen a lot of this spreading relatively rapidly because of the international travel that's been going on. You know, people are getting out and traveling more. And so we've seen this spreading through Western Europe and the United States, etc. People with monkeypox simply have like a fever, headache, muscle aches, chills, because it's a virus. A lot of viruses look the same, whether it's flu or COVID, you get that fever, muscle aches, chills, headache. That's typical. You also get the exhaustion. But what's most notable about monkeypox are the lesions that people are getting, these kind of blisters that are forming on the genitals if it's acquired through sexual contact or on the face and hands through you know, more casual contact. Hmm. How dangerous is this virus? You know, is this something that if you get it, what are your chances? Are there long-term implications? Do we not know? We don't know yet because there are, have been fewer cases, but it doesn't seem like there's a high mortality rate. It seems like there's a very low mortality rate. What's more concerning, like I said, are these lesions. You know, so far we've had 77 cases in Michigan and no fatalities. Of those 77 cases, about 19 have been in Detroit and 13 in Oakland County and 10 cases in Macomb County and some nine cases in Wayne County outside of Detroit. It's not a high number, but we're also wanting to be very cautious and vigilant because of our recent experience with coronavirus and how that spread rapidly and grew uh, exponentially over time. So what do we know about its transmission? Is this the kind of thing where if you use a door that somebody else that happened to have monkeypox, you can get it? Or like, what level are we at here with transmissibility? Yeah, I haven't seen an R naught or like the number of people that it's going to spread to for every one person infected. For COVID, it was like two or 2.1. So pretty high. If you got it, you're going to infect two other people. And that's why you had that exponential growth. For right now, what we're seeing is that it's, being spread among men who have sex with men. And it's also being spread among people who are close contacts like roommates or people who are live in the same household. And so that's where the vast majority of cases are. And so it's less likely to be spread on a surface um, like a doorknob or something like that. And it's more likely to be spread through long, close contact or close exposure. And so our health department here in Detroit is taking a proactive approach where they're seeking out folks who are in a higher risk community, like in the LGBTQ community, and reserving their vaccines for folks who are at high risk or who have a contact point who has already tested positive for monkeypox. Hmm. Now, to be clear, you know, we're talking about the LGBTQ community. There's nothing about being in that community that means that you would get it. It's about the behaviors and it's completely possible for women to get this right or for straight people to spread it to each other. It's just about that connection loop. Yeah, anyone can get monkeypox just like anybody can get COVID or the flu. The CDC and our local health department are saying that it's most commonly seen in this higher risk group. That's where the targeting effort is to get vaccines and spread education to reduce the risk of future transmission. So what is the chance that this 
kind of gets out to a wider level. Like one listener asked about, let's say, you know, somehow children came in contact, right? Like an uncle or an aunt, and then like they had a family reunion like a few days later. And how much of a chance of that kind of stuff is there or people need to be thinking about? It's really hard for me to say just on a personal level, you know, we watched COVID be, you know, downplayed by government officials for a while at the outbreak of COVID back in early 2020 and late 2019. So, you know, it's really hard to say because we don't have enough data yet about the transmission and it's really difficult to say how widespread this will be. I'm hoping that we've learned something from our trials and tribulations through coronavirus and that our proactive effort in targeting folks who are high risk and educating and getting vaccines available will make a difference. You have to remember that right now we do have vaccines for monkeypox, whereas in early 2020, we did not have vaccines for COVID. So early vaccination among targeted populations like elderly folks in nursing homes, could that have prevented a wider spread of COVID? It's hard to say because we didn't have that opportunity. I'm hoping that this is tamped down by the availability of vaccines and our ability to do something now. Right, right. And so what are the steps that people just need to take or or not take, whatever you need to do, just to make sure that you lower your risk of this? If you are in a high-risk group and you're living in Detroit, reach out to the Detroit Health Department. They have a good amount of vaccines and they are welcoming folks to come through and get vaccinated. It's a two-dose series. A few of our patients have already gone through and gotten vaccinated. And it really took like a screening phone call and then a visit there. If you live in Oakland County, similar, reach out to the Oakland County Health Department and chat with those folks about uh, your risk level, contact points, et cetera. And then they will likely vaccinate you if you are in a higher risk group. For those of us with an average risk, if you're going through an office building or a bar or restaurant and touching a door handle, it's always a great idea to wash your hands before you touch your face and mouth. And if you are worried about your risk as an individual, you can always wear a mask as that can help to reduce the risk of uh, spread of viruses as well. So basically, just practice good hygiene and precautions and status normal in this if you are someone who does those kinds of things. Right. And then if you are higher risk or let's say you have a household contact, getting vaccinated right away is going to be important. Okay. All right. Let's move on to the topic of insulin. This has been a hot one. What has been happening in Washington that's kind of brought this to the forefront? Although, let's be honest, the cost of insulin has been a talking point for many years. Recent legislation that has been passed unrelated to healthcare involved a uh, line item that was placed in there by some powerful lobbyists to remove the $35 per month cap on the cost of insulin. So before this legislation passed, insulin prices were capped at $35 a month for all Americans. And now that $35 a month cap on insulin cost is only in place for folks with Medicare. This gets a little bit nuanced and in the weeds, but there's something called a pharmacy benefits manager that essentially is somebody who takes money from you that stands between you and your pharmacist. And they artificially inflate the cost of medications. Medication costs in this country are essentially decreasing over time as more and more medications are becoming generic. However, pharmacy benefit managers have put themselves between you and your insurance company and the pharmacist, and they often work hand in hand with insurance companies and pharmacists to increase profit margins to the tune of $200 billion a year. Pharmacy benefits managers make $200 billion a year. And one of the biggest medication costs that they inflate is that of insulin. So if you're buying insulin from the pharmacy, let's say the insulin costs $100, the pharmacy benefit manager might tack on $120 for that insulin and you might be paying $320 for the insulin that should cost about a hundred bucks. That's a lot of information. What sucks about this is it really messes up folks who need insulin. There's 7 million Americans who rely on insulin. And for 25% of those 7 million folks, insulin is not affordable for them. I mean, I know people personally who have traveled to Canada for it. Of course. I mean, that's the beautiful part of having a neighbor that has reasonable drug pricing 
The price of insulin in foreign countries is typically between $20 and $50. We're the only nation where people routinely spend $100 to $200 on their insulin needs per month, which is atrocious. Oof. So what have you been working on and doing with your patients and kind of also getting the word out? Because I've seen you like in other media outlets and things like that, because this is something that I know strikes a lot of not just Detroiters, but Metro Detroiters, right? Like we talk about the city of Detroit. But Metro Detroit has a lot of people who cannot afford this insulin, and it's a real concern. Uh, A couple of days ago, uh, Veronica Meadows from Fox 2 Detroit reached out to me. She's working on a story about this legislation change that removes that $35 cap, and she wanted to chat with me because she actually read one of our blog posts. The title of the blog post is Free Insulin in Detroit because we give people insulin for free. We have a set number of samples that we get every month, and it's enough for our patients in our community and we give out free samples of short-acting insulin called Fiosp and long-acting insulin called Traceba. And this helps our patients manage their diabetes in an effective way. We're able to do this because I'm a family physician and I can get free samples from Novo Nordisk. And we help maybe 30 to 40 patients a month with free insulin samples. And that's essentially like, you know, one to 2% of our patient population needs some form of insulin. And so we were able to help those folks with free insulin and literally save them hundreds of dollars per month. So I just gave somebody nine pens of insulin. Each of those is about $125 at the pharmacy. So I gave them essentially $1,000 of insulin, which will cover them for the next two to three months for free. And I saved them $1,000, which is a great feeling, but really sad if you think about you know, the people who don't know about this program or don't have the ability to, you know, get down to our office. It's kind of frustrating that knowing that people are going without insulin because they can't afford it when there are some opportunities to get it for free or reduced cost. I know stuff goes viral online, but there are so many times where I look at something and it's like, this is a broken system and a sad story, but it's wrapped up as a heartwarming story. You know, I think about that guy who walked, you know, from his work to Detroit every day and they gave him a car. Yes, it's great that he got a car and I'm not denying that. But the problem is, is that there was no transit or ways for him to get to work in the first place, nor did he make enough money to be able to pay for a car on his own. Like those two specific things where it's like, that's a sign of a broken system. Although it is a heartwarming story that, you know, people adopted him and got the car and all that other kind of stuff. I can't help but look at that and go, man, like I know that it tears at our heartstrings, but also, can we wake up and look at like, this doesn't work? Yeah, exactly. Think about the thousands of other employees who just gave up because they can't walk. They have mobility issues or they have a disability or they can't navigate a wheelchair seven miles each way to walk to and from work or whatever that distance is. And why don't we have a functioning mass transit system in, in Detroit or Metro Detroit or you know all of Michigan? to get us to where we need to go safely and efficiently so we can work and have a great quality of life. And similarly with insulin, yeah, it's cool that we're helping 30 or 40 Detroiters have access and Metro Detroiters have access to free insulin, but what about the thousands of Michiganders who need insulin every day and who are going without it and suffering complications like uh, diabetic retinopathy, which is the leading cause of blindness in the United States, or you know, foot infections that can lead to amputations. Diabetes is the number one cause of foot amputations because people lose sensation in their feet. They get an ulcer, it gets infected and because they can't feel it because of the diabetic damage to their nervous system, they need an amputation to save the, the rest of their body. These are really sad systemic problems that need systemic answers. And unfortunately, we've built this healthcare system that's more about making as much money as possible Thus, you have these pharmacy benefit managers making $200 billion a year on increasing the cost of our medications. And yes, we need a system-based answer. Otherwise, we're going to continue to face these problems. Do you have any ideas since you're on the ground about a system-based answer? Yeah, we need to remove pharmacy benefit managers. They're someone that does nothing for your health care, but only inflates the cost of your care. Why do we need somebody to tack on additional charges under the the auspices of the insurance companies and large big box pharmacies. It's collusion, it inflates the cost of care, and it's harmful for everyone in the United States because we're paying for it directly and indirectly. 
if we were just able to manage people's diabetes at the time when they need the medications, uh, we wouldn't have to deal with the harsh long-term consequences and downstream effects that takes people out of the workforce or takes people out of our society and makes them shut in or disabled. Is that one of the ways that you're able to, when you're a member of Plum Health, and we have a number of listeners who've become members and have, have been telling me this, is this part of why like, there's a number of uh, medications and prescriptions that you're actually able to fill? Yeah, I mean, we buy all of our medications at wholesale. We can get you know, 90, 95% of the medications out there for our patients at cost. And then we just so happen to be able to get free samples of insulin through industry. That's been really helpful for our patients in general. And that's why people sign up with us because you know, for the monthly membership, they're getting really transparent pricing on all their medications. And some things are cheaper at the pharmacy. Like you might be able to get a vaccine cheaper at the pharmacy and we'll let you know that, hey, this is less expensive at the pharmacy. You should go get this done there. Um, it's more expensive at wholesale for whatever reason. And that's usually for branded medications or newer medications. Mm -hmm. All right. And then finally, I want to talk about this vaccination thing. And you're speaking of vaccinations. You know, it just makes me think about this that uh, a recent story that nearly a third of Michigan toddlers are at risk for preventable diseases. Now, to be clear, because I know the audience is completely over talking about COVID, this isn't really about COVID. This is really about a number of vaccinations that, frankly, were eradicated for you and I's time or severely beat back. But we apparently have large numbers of people who are not getting vaccinated and children. Can we talk about that and what's going on? Yeah, frankly, we're taking our eye off the ball. And then the pandemic really separated patients from their physicians. And so typically you'd go in every month or two with your child to the pediatrician or to the family medicine doctor and get your typical vaccines for measles, mumps, rubella, tetanus, diphtheria, hepatitis, polio, chicken pox, et cetera. And getting those regular vaccines is just part and parcel of a typical doctor's visit. And so when outpatient practices shut down for a time during COVID or people have been staying away from doctor's offices and gathering places because of their concern about getting coronavirus, these vaccination rates have dropped off. So there's been a 6% decline in the typical vaccination rate since 2019. Mm. So what are some of the effects of this? Well, it just makes us really susceptible to an outbreak like we kind of joked around um, maybe three, four or five years ago about oh, all these floofy people in California where the vaccination rate is dropping. And so now they're having an outbreak of measles. Like shouldn't measles be eradicated? But no, here it's back because people are skipping out on their MMR vaccines due to not being able to visit the doctor or through misinformation or through, you know, vaccine fatigue. You know, we've been talking a lot about coronavirus vaccine some political parties have weaponized COVID vaccines or the jab. And so now people have erroneously thought of all vaccines as one bad vaccine. I don't want any vaccines now, you might hear somebody say, because they just don't understand it or it's been weaponized by a political party. And so now, you know, you have a generation older than current. So like the adolescents in Michigan have a 72% coverage rate, but the toddlers, so like two to five-year-olds have a 68% vaccination rate for the typical MMR, tetanus, pneumonia, chickenpox, et cetera. We really need to have a 90% vaccination rate to achieve herd immunity for measles. And we're currently at 68% for toddlers and 72% for adolescents. So it's only a matter of time before we have a measles outbreak in Michigan that's large and consequential. And it's all preventable. Yeah, these are vaccine preventable illnesses. And the crappy thing about measles, it is so contagious that for every one person who has it, nine of their 10 contacts will get measles if they're not fully vaccinated. That's nine of their 10 close contacts. So if you have one kid that goes to school and there's 10 kids that aren't vaccinated in their class, nine of those classmates are going to get the virus and it could have potentially severe consequences. You know, in your practice, when you run it into these kinds of issues, if you, you run into somebody who doesn't want to do this or they're on the fence, like what is it that you would tell them? And what is it that you would tell somebody who is listening in our audience? Because we have a large audience with many different political perspectives. What would you tell them from your perspective? Vaccines are safe and effective. And 
The tragedy in this is that if you have a trusting relationship with a family physician or a primary care doctor that you've been with for a long time, you're more than likely going to get vaccines that are recommended by that doctor because you trust the physician, you trust working with them. And so my advice to you is, you know, find a physician, find a doctor that you like to work with and that you trust and work with them to improve your health. And as time goes on, they're going to recommend vaccines to you. And these vaccines are safe and effective. And you know, I can say that a hundred times and you may not believe it, but you might find a doctor that you trust who does recommend it. And that might increase your chances of getting the vaccine. You know, that- for example, I had some somebody come in today who cut themselves and they needed their tetanus booster because it had been nine years since their most recent Tdap. So, you know, they have a trusting relationship with me and they, they got the vaccine, which is going to prevent them from getting tetanus in case the laceration that they got today had been infected with tetanus. Is that part of why you see communities of color, poorer communities have even lower vaccination rates? Is that lack of access to healthcare, lack of access to a doctor? Yeah, exactly. And this is the, if you want to talk about a systemic problem, there are not enough family physicians, pediatricians, and communities of color and low-income communities. And frankly, Medicaid clinics aren't the nicest places to be or not as clean or not as nice as like a private practice office. And so people avoid going to those sort of places where they feel uncomfortable or not well cared for. And if you have Medicaid and you have a hard time finding a physician because there's nobody in your geographic area who accepts Medicaid, that's going to reduce your ability or your willingness or your trust in getting the vaccines that you need. And so there's a whole host of systemic issues. I've said this before, but you know, there's only about 100 primary care physicians in Detroit for 600,000 residents. So that's one doctor for every 6,000 residents. And if you go up to Oakland County, there's one primary care physician for every 600 residents. So that's a 10x disparity between Oakland County and Detroit in terms of primary care access. And as we know, the majority of people get their vaccines through their primary care doctor. Wow. Well, Dr. Paul Thomas, I don't like to necessarily end on a bummer note, but I do appreciate all the data and the information and, you know, helping us guide like what we need to worry about, what we need to think about, what we need to talk to our community, our family members about. I do appreciate you, Dr. Paul Thomas, Plum Health Direct Primary Care. And uh, until next time, my friend. Thanks, Chair. Have a wonderful day and everybody stay safe out there. And we are done for today. Thank you so much for listening. In coming attractions, Devin O'Reilly joins me tomorrow. We're trying that new Black Cherry Verner's out. We're going to give a little bit of a review and think about some cocktails for it to go with. Plus, we've seen that new HBO documentary, the first episode of Hard Knocks. We've got some thoughts and insights to talk about. And then finally, there are some major improvements coming to Michigan Avenue in Corktown. I'm Jer Stays. Remember that you are somebody, and we'll see you around Detroit.